You know, in looking at this subject uh, called freedom, the word freedom, the first occurrence that we find of that word is in Exodus. We see there that the Jews called myrrh, and we, we know a lot about myrrh. They called it the myrrh of freedom. Did you know that? I didn't know that. But we're going to talk a little bit about that. And of course, we know that the first person that came uh, to Jesus asking, asking him how to be born again, and I'm referring to Nicodemus, was the one that covered the Lord's body heavily with a mixture of aloes and myrrh. And the whole purpose for using myrrh for embalming was, you know, to resist the decomposition of the body. And I want, you, I want you to keep in mind we are the body of Christ until the time of resurrection. Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence once again. So very grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to continue on in the study of your word together, to feast upon it. Keenly aware of our limitations uh, and how infinite that your word is. As usual, I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness that seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. And as I said in the introduction, the first occurrence of the word liberty or freedom is found in Exodus. All the way back in Exodus chapter 30, verse 23. Now, when we look at that, we don't readily uh, quickly notice that it's the word uh, free. It, it takes a little looking, uh, kind of looking uh, very, uh, we have to look sharply at that to see that that the word is there. It's there, translated pure uh, myrrh in the Hebrew. There's a shrub which produces myrrh. Uh, that which is uh, purest, the purest, and uh, uh, the most natural way that that they extract that is. Uh, it's called the myrrh of freedom or free flowing myrrh is as uh, the Jews would, would actually call it the myrrh of freedom it was used in sacrifices it was used as uh, incense Roman soldiers would put it in their hair uh, you know as a uh, as an incense it was also as we know it was used in the embalming process Jews applied it as an antiseptic to corpses uh, we know that from John chapter 19 uh, with Nicodemus or that Nicodemus came and uh, we're talking about the first Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night and he brought you know he was a rich guy him and, uh, and, and Joseph were both very wealthy they had servants uh, uh, some of the commentators have said that they actually packed this myrrh and aloes uh, in by mule, a uh, hundred pounds, says the authorized version. Well, the the uh, I thought, well, that's a lot, but then I, it's a little less. It's seventy-five pounds because the Romans uh, they scaled a pound as twelve ounces, not sixteen. So it was seventy-five pounds, but still, that was a lot. And so the text says about a hundred pound weight. 
So we, we see it used in the context of sacrifice, of perfume, something that smells good, and embalming. And of course, we know, you know, much more about myrrh from the Gospels and so on and so forth. So I believe that, and I, and I got to caution you people again, I'm, we're looking at some symbolism here. And this is how I see it. Uh, I'm surprised that none of the commentators have mentioned this. I've never heard of this anywhere. I've never known this until now. Uh, I just thought that I would do this series on our freedom that we have in Christ. And boy, has it been an eye opener right from the right from the gate i think that we can rightly say that our lord's body was weighted down heavily with a sweet smelling savor known as the myrrh of freedom and that's after he offered himself as our sacrifice and this by the one to whom jesus explained the, the reality of the new birth nicodemus i find that fascinating Jesus' body was heavily covered with free-flowing myrrh, what the Jews would call the myrrh of freedom. And we were made free in Christ. The body of Christ was made free, set free in Christ. And keep in mind that this was applied to slow down the decomposition of the body until it was raised. So the first time that we see that word freedom occurs in Exodus. And we are his body. We're buried with him in baptism. Romans 6, 4, I remind you. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism. That is identification into his death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might what? Walk in newness of life. Folks, I hope that you get... I hope that you get a lot out of this, this, uh, these next few uh, videos. I don't know how many there's going to be. Uh, I do intend to transcribe uh, from the video uh, the text and turn that into text for uh, a future pamphlet or book or something that I can throw up back up uh, up here on Barnes and Noble uh, for those of you who might want to have that. Just have this this study here on record. So let's get into this. This this is this is quite interesting. I find this whole subject quite interesting. I don't think there's anything that we can talk about that's more exciting than our freedom that we have in Christ. And and Christians today will misunderstand that freedom and actually uh, mislabel that freedom and 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 look at that as something negative rather than positive. So I hope to talk about that and and explain that in, in, a, in a way that, hopefully, in a way that people will understand the difference between uh, how we might look at freedom, our freedom in Christ, and uh, what that freedom in Christ really means. So this series of videos will focus on that one subject, and it'll, it'll do so by looking at the words freedom, uh, free, uh, freed man, uh, slave, uh, the opposites, the antithesis of, uh, of that, uh, slavery, bond, bondage, that sort of thing. You've got to always look at the opposite side of the coin. And through an honest examination of Scripture, my prayer is that you'll see just how crucial a matter that this is. The word liberty is really seldom even mentioned today in Christian circles. And I find that shocking. I mean, we seldom even hear much about the word liberty, freedom, bondage, slavery, etc. When you walk into the church door, you just don't hear people standing around talking about, oh, how free we are in Christ. You just don't hear that. And it seems to me like that they ought to be just as famous as a word, you know, free or freedom ought to be just as famous a word as grace. You know, or... Uh, any, any of the mercy or faith or so let's begin by defining the word before we look at a few of the verses on, on biblical freedom in, in later videos I'll, I'll try to 
look at subjects which actually support that doctrinal freedom, free, uh, freedom in Christ. The Greek word freedom is eleutheria. Eleutheria is the word. The usage of the word is, uh, is, is used as freedom, liberty. In the New Testament, there's at least 16 occurrences, roughly, give or take. I've found that it's used by John, Paul, James, and Peter. But never is the word used in the Gospels or Acts, which I find amazing. Of course, that's understandable because we're looking at a, at a point in time in which the Jesus had yet to die on the cross. The body of Christ had yet to come into existence, which it did in Acts at Pentecost. It was the gospel of the kingdom that was being preached in the synoptic gospels. So that doesn't surprise me. But if you do see the word free there, it's a different word. It's, it's apa, I believe it's apolosso, uh, once in Luke, once in Acts, and again, maybe in Hebrews. But eleutheria is unique to Paul. It's unique to Paul, James, Peter. It's used primarily as a state of freedom from slavery. The fact is that modern Christianity has, for the most part, enslaved its congregants to a merit-based religious system that our Lord Jesus Christ died and rose again to set us free from. I'm talking about a system of law, although it does keep its, you know, keep the word grace around. It keeps the word grace in its vocabulary. But the two don't mix. Law and grace do not mix. The first time liberty is seen in the epistles, it speaks of the believer's future deliverance from bondage, the very first time that we see it. Now, the authorized text can be a little misleading here. Those of you who followed me through Romans, uh, you might remember, because the, cre the, the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. It's the creature is the word there. That's us. Into the glorious liberty of the children of God, Romans 8, 21. What is that? That's deliverance from sin, self, law, Satan, the world, and death. Six things. We'll be set free. That's a future indicative. It's a definite, we definitely, it definitely will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. It's a passive voice, passive in the Greek. In other words, in other words we, we won't deliver ourselves. This is future tense. We won't deliver ourselves. God will. Deliverance from what is decaying, uh, decomposing, passing away. Freedom from the body of sin and death. Freedom from all, uh, all sorrows, afflictions, from all uh, reproaches and persecutions. Freedom from the temptations of Satan. Freedom from doubts, fears, unbelief. That's what we're looking forward to. This is future tense. Freedom from the bondage under which the Christian groans. Delivered and changed into the blessed state of incorruption, which will be revealed when a true estimation of our glory, our value, our worth to God will be finally realized. That's what the text is saying where every desire is, is, in our, is only in, in our serving the Lord. Basically, a, a sinless new creation run amok, folks. That's, and the, the really amazing part of this is that after being introduced to this glorious future hope, it'll be seen as we look at how the word liberty is used, that the Holy Spirit then carries us along into the present were that this deliverance into freedom, which we hope for in the future, we are actually able to realize even now in the present as new creations in Christ. And I find that absolutely astounding. So this all ties in to, to death, to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and even death itself. Yeah, death to death. We've died to death. 
I don't know how many times I've mentioned that if, if Christ died in our place, we cannot die. We've died to death. And that by means of, this, and this is the only means, what, not our self-effort, not our good works, but means of our being baptized into Christ, into His death, burial, and resurrection. Identified with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. Or that we walk in newness of the Spirit, not in oldness of the letter. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 2. And no wonder the Word of God admonishes us in so many ways to live as who we already are. Saints, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight, blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ, sanctified, set apart forever by His one sacrifice. We're told to be holy as He is holy. And that eternal life is not something to be someday gained but is even now our present possession. We now possess eternal life. It's not something we're going to possess someday. We are now running, dragging along this dead corpse this of an old man, but someday we will be cut loose from that which prevents us from realizing our full purpose and our full potential. And struggling to be free, folks, actually keeps us in bondage. In fact, such a struggle is, is the bondage. As we'll see, bondage seeks to enslave liberty. We read, in that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in uh, privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might what? Bring us into bondage. Galatians 2, 4. And just what liberty was that? Is it, a, is it a liberty to just do what we want, just live however we want, just let go, you know? Just doesn't matter what we do, doesn't matter how we live. Is that, do you honestly believe that that's God's purpose for liberty? I think not. That's not how true Christian liberty works. Liberty means that we are free from sin and law to serve not free you know to serve god it's not freedom to sin it's it's free to serve despite our sin our old nature which we've died to we read in first peter 2:16 as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice but as bond servants of god that is why we are to, as Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Christ freed us from bondage to law, to, to that bondage to the law. He freed us from that. Why would we who have been made free by Christ want to live as though we were not free? That's why I threw up the picture on the screen of the guy in jail. He's free. He just doesn't know it. And there's... Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Okay? The, the Spirit of the Lord doesn't exist in that realm of legalism, of bondage. So there's no liberty in law-keeping. Contrary to popular thought, true liberty does not result in further ungodliness. In fact, it actually does just the opposite. Liberty results in works and blessedness. How do I know that? Because James tells us in 125, James 125, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forget, forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. 
God calls it the perfect law of liberty. You know, law, a law is a principle. It's, it's the, the principle of liberty. And God calls it perfect. The perfect principle of liberty. Perfect, why? Perfect because it fulfills God's will and purpose in our lives. In fact, we'll be judged by it. That's right. We will be judged by the law of liberty. James 2.12 So speak ye and do, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. There is the possibility of law overcoming and enslaving liberty. 2 Peter chapter 2 Verse 19, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. So liberty is always presented in direct opposition to its opposite, which is bondage. But by our having been freed from sin and law, we are free to serve despite our unchangeable nature the, the old man, the sinful flesh, and that apart from law, being that we've died to sin, self, and the law. When did Christ free us? When he died. And it was in the death that he died that we were identified with him, having died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. And the word death, I remind you, in Scripture means separation. In Christ, we've been separated from all six of those things. They, are, they no longer have any power over the sinless new man, new nature in Christ. Because they all belong to the old sinful nature. Freedom is deliverance from bondage. Bondage to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. But we've got to understand that freedom is itself, I don't want to confuse you here, freedom, folks, is itself a form of slavery, okay? In the sense that we are freed from the law and we, be, we become bond servants to Christ. Slaves to righteousness. If we begin at Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or, or, or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of, of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became, listen, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, that's living under the law, that's the flesh, that's having confidence in the flesh, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. That's understand that you're holy, you're righteous, unreprovable, unblameable. You, you stand before him spotless. You are a slave to God in, the, in, in that sense. And, and how could you not be? How could the truth of that not so grip your soul that it would not prompt you to live as who you are. A righteous saint who stands before God, wholly unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And so having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I hope that I'm cracking the ice on this folks a little bit getting you to, to look at freedom in christ in just a little bit different uh, a light uh, than what most mo much of what modern christianity teaches 
being a slave to righteousness and being free in Christ, it has nothing to do with having confidence in the flesh. Romans 8, 1 and 2, There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, that is law, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that's a principle, the principle of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, let's back up just a little bit. The first time we see the word free, which I don't find surprising, and it's, I'm talking about the New Testament here, is in John chapter 8, verse 32, and again in verse 36, where it is used by our Lord Himself beginning at verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If you continue in My word, then are ye disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that's, you know, I've never met a Christian who didn't know that verse. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered him and said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Our Lord is saying to those who believed in Him, these were Jews that believed in Him, that freedom comes through continuing or abiding in God's Word. It's one thing to be free and, not, and, and know it. It's another thing to be free in Christ and not know it. The Greek says, verse 31, if, that's, that's the authorized version, King James, if, subjunctive mood of uncertainty, if you abide or remain or continue in the Word, and that's, it's, that's a subjunctive, maybe you will, maybe you won't, you, as believers in me, I remind you that they, these Jews believed in Him, most definitely, presently are my disciples, whereby you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. You will, you will definitely, indicative mood, the mood of certainty, come to know, recognize, perceive the, that truth. These Jews had believed in Him. He then goes on to say in verse 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, that's a subjunctive mood, the mood of uncertainty, maybe I will, maybe I won't, you shall be free indeed. Now this is not confusing, folks. It's only confusing when you don't understand that a, a, what is true of us, we may not realize in our experience. Okay, God has made us righteous. We may not believe that we may not realize that we may walk through our through this life never knowing that we are wholly unblameable and unreprovable in his sight same goes for freedom christ set us free but unless we abide or continue in his word we will never know that in experience you know if the christian life folks really was about cleaning up the old man the flesh you know which you know the flesh profits nothing then none of these verses, none of them, would make any sense. Not a one would make a lick of sense. I mean, stop and think. Is it false brethren who came in secretly to spy out our law-keeping, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us into liberty? Are we to stand fast, therefore, in the law-keeping wherewith Christ hath put us into bondage and be not... Uh, entangled again with the yoke of freedom? All right, let's, let's reverse it. See how silly it sounds. Is it, is, it, is it where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's bondage? Is that what the text says? It, it doesn't say, but whosoever looketh into the perfect law of bondage, in this he's blessed. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, speak ye, and so do is they that shall be judged by the law of bondage. It doesn't say that either. And, and, it, and, and I'm not reading here, while they promise them bondage, they themselves are the servants of liberty. 
okay? I mean, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of righteousness and liberty. Are you kidding me? I mean, look, does anybody honestly believe that freedom comes through our having confidence in the flesh? Well, Apparently, modern Christianity thinks so. What these verses clearly reveal is the fact that what is most certainly true of us as believers in Christ may or may not be realized in our experience. There's a difference between position and condition. Okay? Positionally, we've been set free. Yet our condition or our experience may regretfully fall short of realizing it if we do not abide, that is, continue, or remain in His Word. Christ said, abide in me. You know, this is in the context of fruit bearing. So yeah, I know believers, they love quoting those words. You know, if the Son sh therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And, and, and indeed... What our Lord said is true. But then they'll go on to put you under law. What so many fail to realize is that our lives, our service, our message, our ministry can belie that fact. They can fail to give a true impression of that fact. They can disguise or contradict that fact. Simply put, we can be set free and yet live as though we have not been set free. We can remain in bondage to the law, that we can remain in bondage, we can remain as slaves to that which to, of which we've been set free. As, I, as stated previously, struggling to be free actually keeps us in bondage. Why? Because the struggling itself is the bondage. Such a struggle is bondage because it amounts to, it equates to our trusting in ourselves, having confidence in the flesh, not trusting in the one who set us free. When God's people do not proclaim the freedom that He's given them, God will actually pro proclaim a liberty for them, leading to bondage. Just look at Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 17. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ye have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine. And I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. That's what he said. It, it, it's only fitting that those who place his people in chains, that he, he, he puts them in chains as well. 2 Peter 2.19, again, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. The next verse there is interesting as well. For if after they've escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. You could almost take 2 Peter 2.20 and plug it into Jeremiah 34.17. And of course, this same distinction is illustrated in Galatians 4 concerning Sarah and Hagar. It's addressed in Hebrews 2 concerning the incarnation, the very incarnation of Christ Himself, who through the death of, of His cross delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Folks, you stand before God free in Christ. Not free to just go live however you want. You're a, you're a bond servant to Christ. It's, it's that, it's, we're just looking at more positive reinforcement here. You're free to live, to serve, to, to rejoice, to, 
everything. Just fill in. Just just name anything you want. Okay. Put in any of the positives that you want there. Pray, study, go to church, rejoice, give thanks. You know, in all things, just live, love, serve. You're free to do that. You're free to do that. You can go out and you can wallow in the garbage of the old old man if you want. But that's not who you are. He's made you free in Christ. There's nothing that is prohibiting you from living your life in Christ to its full potential. Why? Because He's made you, set you free from the law of sin and death. It doesn't have to preoccupy your mind all the time. In fact, well, I'll go as far as to say it, it doesn't have to, to occupy your thoughts at all. Because we are not our old man. We are a new creation in Christ. We stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. He loves us with an undying love. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He loves us, and I love you too. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.